What's up, everyone? Welcome to the RRBG podcast. I am here live at the Belasco Theater for Decibel Metal and Beer Festival with the one and only Converge. How are you doing, fellas? Well, Nate and Jacob. The other guys are over there. They don't want to be on camera. I'm, I'm great. You're, not, our, you're obviously not great. I could be worse. <laughs> you could be worse. I mean, it's, you know, it's, things happen. It's it, whatever. It's a thing and it happens. Yeah, I don't even care. Was it on like on stage? Did it happen or just like at home? I I honestly don't know. I mean, there've been things going wrong in there for Three years. Well over 20 years, but uh this particular thing, I don't know what happened. Hmm. I I was sitting down eating and all of a sudden I was like, "Why did, why won't my leg bend?" And um I must have tweaked it and just didn't know I did it at some point. Whatever. It's, it, I'm fine. I'm fine. I can't jump around right now like House of Pain. I was going to try jump to complete around. that lyric, but I had no idea what the next jump part was. Jump up and get it down. Um, but, uh, <laughs> oh, are you guys from the Northeast? I mean, you know, House Nailed of Pain, it. Boston, and New York, New Jersey. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. yeah. I'm fine. What does RRBG stand for? I, uh, it stands for the rock and roll beer guy, which is what I call myself. I mm-hmm. see. But I shortened it because a lot of people would turn me down because they're like, oh, I don't drink. I'm like, well, I don't need you to drink. I'm okay. the drinker. I'm the <laughs> All right. So, uh, it's your podcast, your, your deal. I right. thought it was Ruth, Ruth, Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg. Yeah. So I put up Google uh, alerts for the show whenever I have bands on sometimes. And, um, <laughs> I get notifications for anything that has to do with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That would make sense. Sp- yeah. Rock and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Rock and Ruth Bader Ginsburg podcast. That's uh, what I'm re-ban- I'm rebranding to that for sure. That's I would fine. listen to that podcast. It'd be interesting. Yeah. So you guys are playing tonight. You're headlining day one of uh, the festival, uh, but you're not known to be a beer band at all. So how did this whole thing come together for you guys to play a beer festival, basically? asked us to play <laughs> yeah i mean honestly like ethically what's the difference we play venues with bars for a billion years yeah you know like i think that it's just sort of like i don't know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are that are part of like sort of like club and music culture that i'm not really all about or into personally and i think that like collectively we aren't but it doesn't doesn't mean it, you can't be play alongside those things you know like people have their passions and they have their things and it is what it is uh you guys just put out blood moon which is amazing by the way it's a departure i would say a little bit for some of the older heads for you guys but if anybody's been keeping up with the band i mean to me it felt like a like a natural thing because you guys have been doing that festival the Blood Moon Fest is it, is it called Blood Moon, right? The Roadburn. Uh, yeah. Thing that you guys well, did? we we did it. How, how do you like? <laughs> I I don't think it's that much of a departure. No. If you yeah. listen to the discography of the band, I mean, every you fucking record, pay attention. If you were paying attention. <laughs> um, no, uh, I think if you listen to. The entire discography, every record has, if not one, at least, you know, I mean, like, there, there are a few slower, moodier songs in, in that same vein. I think this is just the best um, reali- realization of that that, that we've, we've done. And, I mean, for a long time, we talked about wanting to do a record that was just focusing on that sort of material um the the road burn thing happened because they approached us asking if we would do a set that was all you know the slower material and um it kind of snowballed into being a collaboration it it originally it was just going to be the four of us and then yeah because kurt had the ideas of trying to do like the big band thing for a bit too and that was like a great way of Almost, it almost like completed the idea. Yeah. You know, like so it kind of made it like a give us like a mission to a degree, like a way to just do something different and start this up that we want. Some it rekindled the idea. Yeah. Now how did how did you guys decide upon bringing in you know Brodsky and, and Chelsea Wolf? Um, and they're both awesome. I mean, yeah. I mean, awesome. aside from them being awesome, well, um, I think. And Ben, we and and, and Ben, and ben I, I think yeah. it started. 
with Steve where that just seemed like a no-brainer because you know he's in our circle already and he was in the band previously and we you know we've all played in other projects with him and stuff um, and so and, and we we knew that you know he could handle it yeah handle the, the material without having to even think about it really because he's such a talented musician um, and then um, I think Kurt had the idea of approaching Ben Chisholm or was it you I think I can't remember the the direct like the first direct contact with that stuff. I know that they knew they they knew that we that you and I were fans of this the second record when that came out. And then like I th- I want to I feel like that Ben may have gotten in touch with Kurt about some engineering uh subjects around that time and then things started yeah, to kind of but as far as having him involved oh involved in project, I, I oh think yeah we do, we talked about it like almost yeah almost like right right after the road burn thing be like you know because he's so, he's so talented he's just like yeah and we knew that we would need someone that could run samples and stuff like that and then actually chelsea's involvement i i think all of us were like oh it'd be really cool if chelsea was a part of this but None yeah. of us wanted to ask her because we felt like it was overstepping. And when Ben started working on the material, he, she approached him and was like, you think they would let me sing on some songs? Yeah. And he told us, and we were like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's such a great marriage, too, the, the way that it, everything works together in the album, like just the harmony of all the different voices and everything. And That's, you know, that that's, that's also... A lot of that comes down to Kurt's, Kurt's mixing and mastering, no, sorry, mixing and engineering chops, because he was given so much material through that process to make that record. It was, um, yeah. it was probably a challenge to navigate all of that and make yeah, it musical, sure you know, um, sometimes. But yeah, I mean, we're all really, really stoked on, on where things were at with the, that version of the band. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun just to watch it evolve. Um, I mean, C- Converge has always been collaborative in, in the way we work together, but it was it, this was very different because um, we had to do a lot of it remotely, and mm. so it was really cool and interesting to see the way songs evolved when other people got a hold of, of the tracks and right. they would send something back. It was very different than the way we would we would normally do it, where we'd all be in the room and we'd figure it out together. Yeah, we'd like hash it out then. This yeah. was like we had to be more open-minded to the whole process. Yeah, is, this was like, oh, you did that. Okay, let's I'd, go that I way. hadn't even considered that. Yeah, that changes everything. Mm-hmm. Now we're gonna. Now I guess we're going in a different direction, but like, it really just made everything stronger. So it it, it was really fun, really. A, a really interesting and uh, cool process to be a part of. Were the lyrics like uh, collaborative as well, or yeah, was com- that mostly completely? No, it was actually just the opposite. And so, um, like I, I, I purposely didn't want to work on too much lyrically, and in, in ter- in, until we actually had song structures really down, because these songs were, um, they were, they were changing every. I mean, we worked on this for quite a long time, on and off. And every time there was a, there was movement in it, things would change so much that I didn't want to get married to an idea and and then lose that idea because the part just changes or like have like a, a lyrical narrative start to sort of you know be told and then have to rewrite it because now you know the the end is now the beginning You're and stuff like right. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I and just you don't want to get married to like only being able to hear something a certain way. Yeah, because that does it, and I I also feel that like when vocals come into play in a song, um, especially something like that, it really it really sort of is like the last it's like the last ingredient which defines like the melody of a song. So even if there's really really incredible memorable guitar stuff and things that are happening and really cool guitar melodies and hooks and whatnot 
a vocal is always something that people will identify and like I didn't want to like put that stamp on something and then like it just clash with everything else and I want to leave room for others so I was just like I'm just gonna wait and I'm just gonna see see who takes the lead on what aspects of certain songs and and whatnot and usually like the person that brought the initial song idea if they wanted to you know write a melody or had that down like Steve for example or Chelsea in those instances they would be like I'd wait for their their sort of input before I gave any input or started you know editing those ideas and working with them. Um, Steve and I worked a lot on uh, just a lot of a lot of lyrical content. I did and I did a lot of editing with him too. Where like we just kind of sit and work on harmonies and mel- melodic ideas and stuff like that and change things that would just flow better. Which is a different way of working than typical converge where we kind of get like like we're all really open-minded but we also get really sort of cemented in our roles and just kind of stay in our lanes and add what we need to add and this is just different it was loose i, I liked that a lot it was something different cool yeah, challenge it, it was it was the same with the music as well oh definitely you know, yeah whenever i put an idea out there for everyone it, it was it, it wasn't the same as if i was writing a song for you know a normal normal converge record um, it would it was more like here's a sketch yeah a sketch draw, is draw a great way to put it sketch and show me show me what what this makes loose you yeah they were all see, you know uh, that's like a really great way to describe it they were all sketches to start as that's opposed right. to like fully formed ideas i mean so speak, anyway whatever. it speaks <laughs> it speaks a lot about you know your guys's approach at, at, at this point like bands that have been doing it for so long you get kind of stuck in their ways and like don't want people to like collaborate with them or change them up too much so it's really awesome to see this kind of i wish more bands would do stuff like that you know? yeah i mean me too yeah, yeah. but I, I think one of the strengths that kind of helped us with that is that all of us you know have other projects where we're regularly collaborating with other people and um, you know I can't speak for anybody else but for myself having done that for so long it kind of made me be a little more open to just you know being aware of the group of people that I was with and like letting it be what it is instead of me trying to push and I and say this is what I want this to be it, it's you know it's it's more this group of people are together right now and this is what's going to happen when this group of people are together and it's you know trying to force creativity in that situation just sucks creativity out of the situation yeah yeah for sure if, if that makes sense mm-hmm. I don't know yeah I agree for you, you you specifically you're you know you're doing double duties this weekend you're playing yes. with cave in um, how is I mean are there plans to tour blood moon as a package with everybody like with Steve and, and Chelsea and everybody like the we whole crew s- we certainly want to yeah it's a you know and that so like to I guess to be clear because it's hard to be clear because it's a whole new idea but like converge blood moon is ba- is, is a seven piece version of our band yeah. like that's what it is you know it's like the big band version of us and both versions, you know, exist and will like exist that way, which is sort of cool. So like, it will like will, at least in our, in our, the way we look at all of this, like, and all the members, like you know, that's that's the band. So we won't like go out and just do like us with Steve and be Blood Moon or us with right, just Chelsea. It's just the band. Yeah, yeah it's it just wouldn't work without. Yeah, the band it's just because because we act, we all contributed so much together. Like that's the thing. Like a lot of bands. You could do that, but with this, I feel it would be like really disingenuous to do that. Yeah, you know, and, and like especially after, you know, if, if you if you have the record and you've been listening to it, if we did that without someone who was on that record, yeah, it'd be yeah, weird. It work, yeah, it really know? wouldn't work. It's like everyone's so so unique that's on it. There's but, no. But, but to answer your answer your question, I'm, I'm fairly certain that yes, that will happen. The the schedules that need to be juggled to make that happen. That's what I was going to say. I also mentioned the double duties because, like, I know Kaven's ramping up to to drop a new album and yeah. probably go on tour and all that. So yeah, I mean, it's just we just have to be aware of all of our schedules. And That's it. We can make it work. Make yeah. It work. 
So um, I know that you know you're probably not thinking about this now because this album just came out and you're still you know logistical nightmares that you just mentioned, the schedules and everything. But um, I know that we had a lot of time with the pandemic to kind of sit around, create. And is there more material that I know that Blood Moon it says one on it, so I know there's more coming. Yeah, well, there was like a. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. It's also an informational design challenge, like how we were going to present that whole record and this new idea, and how would we title record or records or, or what have you. And I think we just wanted to like make it like a structure that we could just continue, like Blood Moon 1, Blood Moon 2, Blood Moon 3. I want there to be a thousand of them, you know. I know there won't be, but you know, we'll try, see what happens. Um, but it, yeah, it's... It's a mouthful, but it works well. And I, I've honestly always enjoyed records that have had numerical names too, yeah. numerical titles. It's just sort of something that I like personally. So I was in. For Led Zeppelin. They, it's they're pretty good. Till, till it didn't. Till they changed. Oh, all that other stuff. Yeah, they changed it, and then all that stuff happened. Yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, I I also think that in a way, like numbering it was like kind of putting a challenge on ourselves like okay now yeah. we're saying that we're going to do this again so we we better we have to do now this we got to do this deliver, again so yeah and i mean i i think in some ways our uh circle seems to work well with a deadline yeah so otherwise it's just we're just noodling around so <laughs> When, it, when it's like, okay, there's a hard deadline when things have to get done. It's like, okay, let's fucking get to work. Yeah, that, that's that's definitely also a little bit of like the residual effect of like having a bunch of other bands and, and, and poles in our lives. We're like, you know, we have to do that. Like if we don't do that, like he's right, like things would just get, they, they just wouldn't, they wouldn't get finished. And like, and it's not to say that like, we will put out something subpar because we put a deadline on something. It just makes us work harder you know to to complete things and and move on yeah and i feel like we're all fairly um, good at immersing ourselves in something when when it's time to work on that thing yeah and yeah so do you think there'll be any kind of like break between like if the theoretical number two like will there be a regular converge album and then part two or do you think you're going to maybe go straight into two i really don't know we don't know. We really like just like casually talking about music the other day. We have no idea. Like not none of us have like a real like a strong opinion on any of that stuff. It's more like whatever we feel motivated to finish and do at that time. That and that's just the the natural thing that's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, my my general feeling on that with, with any band I'm in is just get in the room together, start making noise, and just see what happens. Yeah, I mean that's the best way to do it. Yeah, I don't, I, 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 it, technology is very helpful to be able to send files back and forth and everything, but there's nothing like being in the room. With the well, room you know too. what's what's hard about it is that you can feel like you can have a prolific personal moment, right? And you can write a bunch of stuff, and you can like be really excited. But when you present that to a group digitally versus like in the room and getting that immediate feedback it's it's tough because it can it can become kind of self-defeating because nobody's going to have the same enthusiasm and excitement for you when you're just sort of like throwing information at them when they're in the middle of their daily life that's yeah. not that where they're not in that creative headspace yeah. and so it's like in some ways that could kind of deflate your own excitement about your art and music sometimes it's worth just like doing it documenting it being excited about it and just kind of like waiting for the, the time where you can present some of these cool ideas and a little bit more of a, a manner that that will serve the song or the material or whatever yeah. i mean in some ways it's kind of better though because yeah you can put an idea out there that I mean, you know how it is you yeah you, know, you can come up with an idea that in the moment you're like this is fucking amazing i'm incredible <laughs> I, I made the most the Everyone's gonna shit the fuck yeah. When they hear this, and then you give it to to everybody, and they listen to it. Like, and if you're in the room with them, sometimes they feel bad being like, I don't know, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. No, I can get. Yeah, it can go both ways. You're right. So like when when you do it that way, it's like 
I think it's a lot easier for people to, to not critique, but to just say, yeah, maybe we should change this, maybe we can do that, maybe we can do, and, and like, just get their point across without having to, like, be, you know, yeah. walking on eggshells or whatever. That, I, I guess with the making the Blood Moon record, that was one, one strength about being remote, is that we could, we could deliver the fully formed idea like a fully formed demo before like one thing like kind of he's getting at is like conversation and sort of compromise and refinement can sometimes like not allow you to actually say your full creative idea because you never get there because it gets interrupted so much before it gets there Um, in an ideal world we'd all be silent until the presentation is over you know (laughs) (laughs) I mean that even even to a, like a lesser extent that happens to just not music creators but just fans of music like it happens to me with you guys or like Dillinger or you know whenever I, I have friends that don't listen to a lot of heavy music and I'm like super stoked on the new album and I'm like guys you're gonna check this out and put it on and then like I'm super stoked and I see the sadness in their eyes like, <laughs> they well, want to be nice to me like oh yeah it's good the other day I I thought I was thinking about that like. It, it, that's that's the, the curse of fanaticism and it happens to anyone who's fanatic about any subculture you know counterculture related thing especially music I was but I was listening to a podcast the other day that I like a lot and they were talking about wrestling and they were talking about that's also like the that that's like the pain of a wrestling fan especially of like like when I was a kid like imagine like being a kid and like going up to somebody and like saying like you need to listen to this Iron Maiden song or you need to check out this thing and you're so enthusiastic about it and like they give no fucks no like they're thinking about w- something that is just not in your world anymore like you're com- you may as well live on different planets <laughs> and I always like, get a gut feeling when that happens like when I'm showing it to someone like oh they don't like this at all <laughs> yeah but it's uh, yeah and it's hard not to take a personal in in a sense that like you just love it so much and want to share it with somebody you know that's all like it's but yeah no i i see it with heavy music i mean i get fucking fucking pumped about like the last dark throne record but i guarantee you i couldn't go outside and find the first 25 people i talked to i couldn't get them stoked on dark throne you know what i mean maybe today today i could out there but like in real life like just like walking down the street not happening i mean i just think in general yeah normal people you know that you're just going to go out and meet on the street they're just not going to be passionate about music anyways. no so like, they're not if that's something that you are passionate about it's you know it can be hard to explain that to someone who isn't regardless of genre it's yeah. a private passion yeah. Private. yeah i mean it blows my mind when i talk to like you said normal people sometimes and they're like they don't even know lyrics. They're like, oh, I really like this song. I'm like, you know what that song's about? And they're like, no. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. How are you, what are you listening to? Like, you're yeah. just listening to the beat in the background? And well, here's the thing, yeah, though. I mean, like, that's valid. Yeah. It's you totally know? valid. Like, here's the thing. We are completely out of touch, though. All yeah. of us yeah. in, in this subculture. We're, we are fucking just completely different animals than, mo- than mo- most of the world. Uh, like, for example, the other day I was talking to talking to my wife and a friend of ours was saying that they went to a concert and somebody that's not related to music or whatever in this world and like we looked up who that person was and I was like what the, I don't have no idea what that is I'm sorry whatever I looked it up and it was like a sort of like a a country like a rock country star that probably had like nine trillion bajillion bazillion yeah. views and listens they may as well been like the most important and popular person that has ever existed in the world. Cool. I had no fucking clue. So who's a weirdo? Yeah, I think we are. I think we're the weirdo. I'm fine. I'm f- absolutely fine with it. That's I why mean, I'm I, here. I, yeah. You know, is you know? there ever any question about that? Like, yeah. it's not no. like this no, it's shit not th- that we got mm-hmm. into when we were young was normal then or yeah. big or popular. Like, how could we explain I thought it was. <laughs> there was a time, no. I feel like in the... 2000 early 2000s where like the mainstream was getting heavy but you know heavy in a heavy, weird way heavy in the sense it of got like, heavy it got heavy like it got soggy like it was <laughs> like you know what i mean like it wasn't like yeah it wasn't 
substantive right. you know it wasn't like you know it it didn't it didn't have teeth it was always like a it was always like a softened sort of more reserved version of aggressive music you know um and that's yeah. and that's fine that's the way it's meant to be yeah i have I mean, no problem with that it's just at this point in life you just start to like think about these things because we're not 18 and just like fucking amped up on the volume and the aggression of something right so you, i you get you get a little more like introspective and analytical about about things well you know to your point of getting older and not being in our teens you know where do we draw the line or where would you draw the line like there are certain way like this is your life this is your career you're doing music how far do we go in order to become successful to monetize it so that we can exist and live in a, a nice you know life like be able to provide for our families and whatnot and also not sell out and keep true to your you know well crazy I, extremity, I think know? that if if I know I don't if, really even at this point I don't even know what selling out is anymore. yeah I mean cause I don't care yeah. Well, because I mean, in our world, like it's kind of a myth. Like, at least in our world, I mean, sure, there's bands that it's existed for, but we're like one of the most like non-marketable bands in the world, you know. Like in terms of like what we are, well, sound wise. Uh, because I have seen converge stuff in like TV shows, and like I see people wearing shirts. Yeah, but people wear shirts everywhere. Yeah. You know, like the thing is, we that that lot most of that stuff's luck, you yeah. know. Like, and it's just like where you where you land with things. Um, I just think that like if any of us w didn't want to just like make music and be creative to express ourselves we just wouldn't yeah. do it yeah. you know and like this I think the same um, that I think we all have the same sort of compass when it comes to like when it comes to like the business aspect of it too like it's just like the business stuff is just residual it, it allows you to just for the, the creative aspect to exist continue going yeah like and i think that there's like a kind of a misconception of like what success is in independent music and aggressive music and like you know like every every musician i know like for the mo even like even like successful musicians in the sense that they're they have large audiences they're no nobody is like crushing it everybody is you know like just your average like like lower to upper middle class working individual that's in this world that happens to have notoriety attached to it because you're like semi-public figures because it's just the nature of what art and music is i mean to me it's just not glamorous it's just sort of a thing you know like um i don't know it's just it's it's a weird subject you know because like i don't th it's it's tough to attach selling out to that when a lot of people are just just existing you know like who am i to artistically say something is like valid or not valid right. like I, there's there's so much there's so much material in, in sort of sub sub genres big and small that don't appeal to me but it doesn't mean they're not valid forms of art and music you know it's just like it just is what it is including the the country thing that I don't know anything about. Yeah, I mean, like it just doesn't connect with me. That I don't fucking like most shit. I don't like. <laughs> he doesn't like much, <laughs> but I also like a lot. But he likes a lot, man. It's really weird. <laughs> but he's like, strange. I'm strange. <laughs> but uh, you know, yeah, I'll, somebody is passionate about that thing that I don't like. So yeah. it's not my fucking place to say whether or not it's valid yeah um as far as like selling out goes like i i think people's view of what you know being a, a successful band is especially like a, a successful guitar band yeah. you know like these days is completely warped and judged on an outdated paradigm like the days of becoming a millionaire from playing fucking loud guitars yeah those days are gone you know it, it, for all intents and purposes man rock and roll is dead it is and and, that and way. i'm okay with that you know like it's it's not king anymore now, sir, there's your headline by the way from this entire thing it's like, yeah. nate says rock is dead <laughs> it is and you know what good yeah. fucking let it die let it fucking just 
dissolve the into the ground well, and then let something else grow out. Well, that's the beautiful thing about all of this stuff. All all of these these sort of like defining genres, like they're they're meant to have like a ebb and flow, and they they're they're all waves that crash, and then other things sort of come out of all of that movement that happens after the fact, and you know, new genres and new things pop up. I mean, you see it now, you know, like heavy, aggressive music isn't the same now as it was 10 years ago, and yeah. it's not the same as it was 20 years ago. Yeah. That's that's the debris floating that's around. Good. That's, that's good. That's Who the boring. fuck wants boring ass shit? We are just talking about that on the walk here. Yeah, you know? it's like maybe I don't dig everything that the kids are into. Doesn't matter. I'm not mm. one of the kids. Mm. It's not for me. Mm. It's for them. Yeah. And fucking, they need their own voice. They need their own, you know, the, the, they need their own fucking you know benchmark bands or whatever that that are gonna be current and um, important to them so who gives a fuck yeah yeah were you uh, so have you gotten to that age where you're done listening to new music absolutely not no so what are you listening to that's new that, that you want to like you should like help put a light on it you know what I mean like, who are you listening to that people should listen to both of you Oh man! Whenever I get put on the spot like this, I'm like, Ugh. blank. Check your phone. Look at your playlist. I'm. Scared. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's the a, way a to band do like it. Idols, but they don't need my help. Right. No, you they're, know, they're yeah. they're crushing it and they're incredible. They're an and interesting band. I think that they're not only doing great things musically, but you know they they've got great things to say. And um, yeah, I mean. I, I, whenever, whenever someone asks me this question, question, I'm like, "Where's my phone? I need to look at my phone." <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how you take in all that, all, all of your music now. You know, at least like you know, young music. You know, just like taking it in a sort of like a sampling way. Yeah. There's so much shit. I don't think I have my phone on me. I, I mean, phone. it's, it's easy. It, to, this no. year alone has been one of the craziest years of music. Th- every so every much band that stuff. I like I put something out this year. Yeah, I uh, mean, like, uh, what did I really dig this year? The new Arabrot record. Uh, Gold has a new record coming out that's great. Um, the Elder and Cadaver. Oh, the co- the collab. Thing. Yeah. What's that? Co- co- uh, Eldevar. Eldevar. There it is. See, there, there. See, that's another collaborative thing. Like, I yeah. would like to see more of that kind of stuff too. Um, the Chisel put out a record that's awesome. Uh, Chubby and the Gang. That record was awesome. Uh, Facts. F A C S. If you listen to them, they're great. I, I, I could. I'll stop because I, I will literally do this all day. I would do that if I had my phone, but yeah, like I, I don't know. I'm a big fan of um, of uh, Johnny Jewel's label. Italians do it better. It's primarily like electronic music to a degree, but I go down weird like weird wormholes with music. Like I'll just like find a random band and then just start following things and going deeper and deeper and deeper into Bandcamp. Are you going to put out a solo electronic project like most heavy metal singers or heavy, no, heavy music? No, I mean, I did, I d- actually did like... You one of Synthwave record? No. Synthwave, man. It's no, cool. it's not, it, there's something about, I, I like, I like sad synth pop, you know, I don't like... You got to go gothy with it. No, no, that's no. not my thing. I like, I, I, I like more like late, like, er, like mid, mid seventies, like disco influenced... Oh synth current synth pop like stuff that's like it's not emotionally neutral it's usually like quite sad um especially like in in like subject matter they're not like they're not like soft pop songs but they're they're really infectious like Um, party all the time from eddie murphy that's a pop song that when you pay attention to the lyrics is very sad it's about you, his girl just You listen to Huey Lewis on the fucking news <laughs> Huey Lewis in the news And yeah. it's fucking devastating Yeah I remember being scared of Huey Lewis When I was a kid Like uh, there was a video they had When they're they're like in the beach But they're buried uh, Up to their heads Stuck with you Yeah dude And that terrified <laughs> me as a child Le- Lyrically like, scary <laughs> You know what The the guitar breakdown In um, Heart and Soul Oh yeah It's a fucking good breakdown that's all. Sorry, I, yeah, I, I, I gotta say, like the the lyrically, the power of love is a massive song. Yeah, it's fucking heavy, man. And like the fact that he 
fits it into the melodies that he does. It's like it's fucking brain surgery. People don't give that band enough credit. That no. was my first uh, live concert, too. Really? I, I was oh, like 11. Oh, that's 10. cool. I love that we're talking about Huey Lewis in the news. They played, they played in Vegas. My dad took me to see him, And then they did a whole set, and then they came back out and did a whole other set a cappella. That's it was, awesome. It was insane. <laughs> I, I, I have a friend who lives in, in my town, like right around the corner from me. And he's like, uh, like 13 or 14 years older than me. And he fucking loves Huey Lewis in the news. And, like, that's how we became friends. Nice. It's like, somehow we ended up just broing down about Hue Huey Lewis in the news. And, like, um, have you seen that, uh, that Instagram account, Rigs of Dad? Oh, yeah. That's my and buddy he, he, Ross. Shout out to Ross. Oh, shout out to Ross. He, he made these shirts that said, uh, no, no Huey, Huey, no news. <laughs> No, okay. what is? It? No, here we no lose. No thanks. No thanks. That's it. Yeah. And I saw it, and it was like, holy shit! It's the best. I need that shirt for for my friend John because, <laughs> and because he like made him as a joke, and I'm like, I want that shirt. It's not a fucking joke. That is for real. Yeah. <laughs> and I gave it to my friend John, and he was like, this is the greatest fucking shirt <laughs> I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. Yeah. And I'm like, because it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I grew up on all of that, you know. And if this is it, if this is it, ooh, like it's a great jam. Yeah, because when I was a kid, musically that was fucking kryptonite. Yeah. But as I got older, I realized the genius of a lot of it. Um, well, was I was thankful that I wasn't kryptonite. I actually liked it, but still, but I, I get. Yeah, it. I, I liked it. Yeah. yeah, I was just, I was a fucking snob. Still am. <laughs> what were you listening to as a kid? Iron Maiden and, Iron Maiden, and, and yeah. Motorhead and yeah. all the, the hard rock my brother was giving me. Mm. So I I started at like a really like like really really early age with having a lot of those those things and those like like real specific sounds given to me and me like understanding like no this is fucking great everything else is garbage <laughs> like and that that kind of like exclusionary thing that kind of happens as you start to I don't know, find your own taste, you know, like, I don't know. It was just like a really important time in my life for like making my palette for music. And so I always started to, even back then I would dig deeper, you know, and like, like, Oh cool. Like that's a heavy thing. I want, that's a cool, scary album cover. I want to see the scarier album cover, you know, like, um, you know, like, I don't know. I remember like listening to Slayer for the first time. I'm like, that's fucking awesome. I love this band who are still probably one of my favorite bands of all time. But then I'll be like, I want to dig deeper than this. Like, what is what is past this? There's more evil or there's yeah. something. Evil there's something. E there's something that's that's more. E this isn't the evilest. Yeah, I need the, the more evilest. I need the evil of the evil. Is this eviler than the yeah, other one? When you say a kid, what, how old are you talking? What would that uh, say? Young, eight, nine. Eight. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like. I mean, the the very first record I ever owned was Marty Robbins' Gunfighter Ballads. Wow. And my dad gave it to me when I was five. You know, and it was, it was fucking sick. Fluorescent pink cover with Marty Robbins in all black with a Zorro mask and a fucking cowboy hat on holding his gun. I'm like, this is sick. I'm well, what, this. What's the first record you bought with your own money, though? The Stray Cats, Rant and Rave. Wow. I don't know what the first one was that I bought. That it would have been a cassette because yeah. I had all cassettes. Um, I do remember my first CD because CDs were so exotic and so expensive. And it was a fucking big deal to get a CD when CDs came out. And I got Dio Sacred Heart. Nice. I think that's what it's called. My the brown first, record with my the My first dragon. CD was Operation Ivy. Oh, that's nice cool. Too. It yeah. took years to get a CD player. Um, like, we were so behind in my house. It was... I love that Yeah, mine, so mine too. Yeah. That's like... The cassettes, though, I was like deep into cassettes. I, oh, yeah. Like, I mean, it probably would have been like, um, like Kiss or Judas Priest. Probably, probably Judas Priest is probably is who just still up there with like one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, but like, I also I went I definitely went through like a Kiss phase early, like Iron Maiden phase. I had all that shit from my brother. Like, I remember he gave me like. Like Motorhead, Nora Morris, like you know, because it was like a little too heavy and gruff. He was more of like a hard rock, like you know, glam metal guy. So like I got like stuff like that from him. And he wasn't really into. 
and then I would find Slayer and things on stuff. Man, we we would get those um, LP cutouts, those radio cutouts. I don't know if you ever seen them, but they used to be like remember they're like three bucks. Yeah. They would cut out the corner, and so like they were not for resale, and they right, usually yeah, stamped yeah. with uh, like a do not sell thing. I remember we got like Ride the Lightning that way. Nice. Um, you know, you know, it took me just like stuff like that. It took me becoming an adult like two year, two or three years ago is when I found out what Kiss stands for. I, I read the Paul Stanley book. I don't even think it's in there. Knights in the service of Satan. I think that's a that's an urban legend. I mean, there's like official like fan sites where they sell memorabilia, and it's called the Knights of the really? Knights in service of like, Satan. I remember being a kid and like at, you know going to church and they. They're, they would be like, it stands for Knights in Satan's Service. And, yeah, 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 or something like and that. And, like, I've never seen the actual band Say endorse that. that anywhere. I mean, it makes sense with the whole, you know, I guess, and yeah. the makeup and the whatever, but... But, I mean, you know, it'd be cool if that's what it did it'd stand be cool. for. Yeah, I mean, be, it makes it a lot cooler. That's when I heard I, it, it, it... To me, that doesn't make sense when you put it in historical context, because they were coming up in the time of, like real like British glam rock you know and where everybody was trying to be and, and they came up you know right after the New York Dolls and like everybody they have more was, in common with the New York Dolls than they do pretty much anybody yeah and, like the Dolls and Slade and yeah all that for sure yeah where Slade people too. were trying to be like androgynous and so Kiss it, it's kind of like Queen where like people would see the name and be like Kiss yeah yeah this isn't macho, you know? Like, Well, yeah, it's like a weird, like, um, sort of like bizarro burlesque show or yeah. something. It's like, yeah, it's just, it's fucking yeah, weird. burlesque. <laughs> it is, it's weird. Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons burlesque it, it show. It is lingerie. <laughs> well, it's called oh. Kiss. It's got all these fucking lights. What is this? They yeah. got platform you know? shoes on. I yeah. guarantee you that that, that, uh, that was the inner th- thought of somebody at a first Kiss show. Yeah. 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 But... Yeah, I mean, it's funny, like, I'm the opposite of Jake with, with that stuff, because, like, metal, I didn't care about metal. No, he's not a metal I, I didn't get into metal until later. You started with punk. I, I started guess. with punk. Like, actually, I started with rockabilly, wow. and then, like, my grandfather was a country western musician, and, like, um, all those old rockabilly and country records were in the house, and then... My mom was into like Bowie and Lou Reed, and she loved the Ramones and stuff. She loves the Ramones and stuff, and so, uh, you know, all that stuff was in in the house. There were the, like the Zeppelin records and stuff like that too, but like that was the stuff that interested me. And then like MTV started, and I saw the Stray Cats, and I was like, whoa, this is awesome. And then like from there, it just went on to searching out other weird stuff like that and th- that eventually led me to X and um, it's a brilliant record yeah yeah. and then you know got into skateboarding and uh, got Thrasher Skate Rock Volume 1 so that's why your knee's all fucked up I'm yeah <laughs> it is skateboarding plus converge equals yeah. bad knees bad knees yeah uh, well final question I want to ask you guys I mean you've, you've been around for a while you've been doing it and, and you've done pretty much I assume pretty much everything you've wanted to do, but is there a, like a fantasy tour thing that, like a festival or a tour package or a venue that you haven't played that you're like, we need to play there before we call it quits? Oh, that's one getting put on the spot again. I'm like, yeah. Fuck. Like I mean, Red Rocks is like one that I get a lot. People are like, oh, I want to play Red Rocks. Well, I mean, like I, I never had aspirations. I still don't. You know what I mean? Like it, with with this sort of thing, <laughs> I don't. Any aspirations at all? Well, I mean, not not with this. I mean, not with. Like I have like you know basic life aspirations, I guess. You know, to like just like, I don't know, <laughs> live. You know. Yeah. Um, but like, but in terms of like, all of this, absolutely n- not. It's just like. Yeah, just I never I just don't because I also don't look at it that way either. Like I don't look at it and go like this is something that I need to continue like checking boxes off of. Like it's just like a it's just a really cool outlet. It's just like this really special thing that like we're a part of in this community. And just as you said, it's like a it's to a degree like in some ways it's a dead art, right? Because it all kind of like it has it, it all 
progresses, it all grows and then, you know, flares up and fizzles away in some way and turns into something else. And the fact that we've been part of this really cool creative wave uh, of musicians, like not just us, but like the countless bands that we know and all the scenes that we've come up in and stuff has like been really fucking cool. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like when I looked at like music history when I was a kid and I would like look at all these like old, like punk flyers and see like historical photos of this and that and I'd be like wow that was such a special time that 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 happened just 20 years ago and in all actuality we've been part of that in our own weird world and we don't really look at it that way because we're just sort of in it presently um and that's I don't know it should that that just that in itself is special you know like so I don't really like aspire for anything else I just can't believe that we're part of this thing that we built together. That's a good answer. All, all I really care about, honestly, like, I, I don't have a goal. I, like, he, like Jake said, I don't really have any aspirations. There's no like bucket list or anything. It's I, all I'm really interested in is finding like-minded people who, you know, are as committed to making good, interesting music as as we are. That's it. Like, I just want to tour with other bands that share that same passion and aren't assholes <laughs> that's that's it yeah mm-hmm. well, jake you got your art um do you have anything like when the time comes that you can't do music anymore like whatever it may be like do you have something else that you are into at all <laughs> he's into a lot of stuff i don't know man uh i mean i i love skateboarding just as much as i love music um yeah, again, you put me on the spot. I don't know. I'm <laughs> well, bad at, at that. Well, um, yeah, that's like a that's a huge part of your life. That's yeah. like a... Yeah, I mean... Uh, now you're just going to rock it till the wheels fall off. Literally. Literally. I mean, you know, <laughs> I've helped build skate parks. Um, just it's a good yeah, way to get like back. Yeah. Like, honestly, I just like being involved in the things that I enjoy, regardless of if I'm the one doing the Actively thing or if in I'm... It. Helping the thing happen, you know that's that's all that, that that's like a really special thing I think about our group of people too. It's just it's we I think we all have collectively a little bit of different mentality because we all like that. Like we all like helping other people have a have a voice or have like I don't know, promote other shit and just like get the word out about this or that. You know, like I know it's a it's fucking cool. It's a community. Yeah. Well. I Just agree do the you. thing. Do, do the thing. thing. Do your fucking thing, people. Um, I want to. I'll let me let you go, so you guys can rest up before you're set and everything. But thank you so much Snap. for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having us, man. Nate and Jake, converge. Pick up Blood Moon for the love of God. You have no idea. It's so good. <laughs> it's wicked uh, fucking good guy. Pitchfork disagrees. Fuck Pitchfork <laughs> gives it like a one or something. <laughs> Fuck those people. No, I mean, I don't care, man. Whatever. No, I just want this. I want to see them make one. Oh, yeah, there you go. That's what I tell people. Yeah, whatever. Hey, the ending of Game of Thrones suck. Make it better. I don't know. You make it better. I still haven't watched Game I, I, mean, I, w- I tried to watch Game of Thrones. We're going to talk about that. I, well, I do know. believe in Game that of once they surpassed the books. the books, they were floundering. Yeah. But, you know, it still looked fucking awesome. Yeah. Like, yeah, I get it. It could have been better, but it, I can't make it better. No. So I'm not going to complain. No. Yeah. The show freaked me out. I watched like that one episode I'm scared of dragons. in Japan. No, I, I put. It, <laughs> I'm scared of dragons a little bit, to be honest. But the, <laughs> the um, <laughs> no, the I turned it on and like it was like it was a sex scene, and then a kid got kicked out of a fucking window, and I was like, <laughs> "What That's the fuck one. is this shit?" And I just turned it off. I'm like, nobody told me about this. Yeah. This is intense. I'm not ready for this. Did they I, tell you that the people having sex were related? I found that out. <laughs> yeah. And so I cha- so I turned that off and I watched. Uh, we were in Japan and I turned on like a Japanese, like weird Japanese fucking game show instead. Those are fun too. <laughs> it was awesome. better. It was way better. Yeah. Uh, well, but so, thank yeah. you again, guys. Uh, no problem. Cheers, everyone. Uh, follow Converge. Nate, you know personal socials for anyone that, no 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 private Take your art you definitely like your website for your art yeah i just it's just my name and then yeah just stuff rec- just google us buy, buy just some google, me, <laughs> <laughs> some art, guys. google me bro google me bro all right cheers
Thank you. <laughs>